medium is electronic, the sponsor are large corporations. There's nothing virtuous or having of integrity. Tool Shed Art Club. Me and Matt are wearing Matt, <laughs> this, like the same jean jackets, basically. It all started, he saw mine last night. And he's like, what? Where did you? This looks like my jean jacket. I'm like, dude, <laughs> let's be in a jean jacket gang. Yeah, David, you need to get one. When Austin walked into the uh, venue last night, my wife was like, is he wearing your jacket? And I'm like, no, I don't. I mean, I don't think so. So, <laughs> so yeah, good show last night, by my, the way. You want me to do a wardrobe change right now? Oh, <laughs> oh dude, he's going. Yeah, All let right. him do it. Well, let him do it. We yeah, go. we can talk about the show. Yeah, go ahead. Dude, the show went great, man. You never know when you're, you're doing stuff with, um, you know, for the government or the at a you corporate know, event yeah or like the chamber of commerce but it was awesome to the point like when i was leaving there was two women who were probably almost 60 and they had some health issues one of the ladies had to leave during my I bit where i talked leave. about the balls yes and she was like will you tell my friend the ball sack joke <laughs> so i did the ball sack joke in front of two women that are almost 60 with diabetes in a handicap stall in the parking lot before i left and that's I just thought it was at awesome. the handicap stall. Yeah, like as I was leaving. That's hilarious. They're like, tell my friend the ball sack bit. Uh, I told my mom that story afterwards. She's watching my kids, so shout out to my mom. David's got the jean jacket on. And, there we uh, go, man. So for people who are waiting for us uh, to tell us to say what we're doing today, we have the first episode starting now of the Boogeyman Book Club. And of course, if you saw a couple episodes ago, we said that we were going to do the book. Amusing Ourselves to Death by Neil Postman, and here we are. So hopefully you picked up a copy of that book. If you haven't yet, it's okay. Go ahead, get a copy, and uh, you can you can listen to this uh, before you read it or after you read it, however you want to do it. And at the end of this episode, we will talk about what the next book will be as part of this book club. So with that being said, uh, David, do you want to maybe kind of talk a little bit again about why you wanted to choose this book for the first book, uh, you know, why you think it's important, and uh, we'll go from there. I didn't really think it was any more important than anything else. I just kind of came to mind because it was probably what I was thinking about, or I might have just reread it at the time. Didn't try to place too much emphasis or thought into making the first, the, try to not make the first one very significant just because it's the first. I'd probably just reread it recently. It's just something I come back to each year. And it gets more and more insightful. You know, every time you read a book, reread a book, you're a different person. So the book kind of reads you in that way. That's kind of why I think it's important to reread good books instead of just reading new books constantly. Yeah, I, I had um, come yeah. across a quote when just going through this book and then listening to some other people talk about it. And this one guy, he was like, when you hold a book, you hold the wisdom of humanity in your hands, as opposed to, you know, when you just hop on Twitter. Telling musical artists what their songs are about. The sad thing about that is that is the wisdom of humanity today. Dude, I like how, um, you know, this book talks about the, the first ever presidential debate between Nixon and JFK which I've also heard people talk about in the past about how, you know, Nixon had that fake like paint on his face to cover up his stubble. And that, you know, everybody yeah. was like, oh, John F. Kennedy, that is a sexy boy right there. We're just going <laughs> to vote for him. And how like Tricky Dick is just a mess. And it reminded me of uh, when Giuliani was doing that press conference and he had his makeup running down his face and everybody was no, like, no, that was this. in court. That was oh in yeah. Court or like yeah. outside the yeah. courtroom. Yeah. And everybody was like, this dude is gross. <laughs> yes. You know, he's got makeup running off of his face and everything. And, um, so I just, I thought that that was, was fascinating. A lot of, a lot of the parallels that, um, yeah, he actually said he lost the election due to his makeup artist. <clears throat> and in the book, Postman talks about, the Las Vegas style of entertainment, which he referred to as junk. And then he said, we have public discourse. 
And he was worried that our discourse was becoming entertainment. And I feel like today our entertainment's becoming discourse because, you know, you don't get any risky comedies anymore, you know, as a comedian, right? Um, or racy right. movies or boundary pushing music. I can attest to that. It's discouraged and it's suppressed and most often it's even censored. So entertainment's no longer really doing its job, which is to entertain. And so nothing's entertaining anymore because everything's infected with ideology or almost like a religious fervor to make a political stance or a virtuous statement to let everyone know you're, you're a good guy rather than a Las Vegas you know, actor. So in this way, it's like a politically correct Las Vegas, which is essentially a McDonald's play place. And the entertainment is becoming discourse when you have top commentators on foreign affairs, say, uh, as Hollywood actors. So you have people living in some ivory tower, tower commenting on the, the public discourse. And he says we don't measure a culture by our trivialities. We measure a culture by what it finds important. And that makes me think of how you opened up about holding the book as as the world's wisdom or whatever it was. And I said that tweets are today's wisdom because there's a lack of wisdom. So like the first chapter, first page, he points out that the television medium is more along the lines of a Las Vegas entertainment culture than it is public discourse. And he says, he actually says, as I write this, the president is a former Hollywood actor and that was Reagan. And our last president was a reality right. TV star. And then he goes on to say mainstream television characters spend more time in hair and makeup than they do on stories. And that's still true. If you look at, you know, debonair Don Lemon, who seems to put more thought into his outfits than his thinking, or even Anderson Cooper, who makes $11 million a year salary just to spew out inflammatory rhetoric. So he's talking about amusing, um, amassing kind of junk uh, from the oral to the written traditions, but then you kind of get more junk as you jump from the written to the television. And then now even more junk from television to internet, which is okay. Junk's fine. I'm, I'm actually a musician. So everything I do is junk, but if you can't discern between the two, um, you get in a weird place. And I think we're in a place now where there's a big imbalance and the junk is weighing heavier on the scale than the other stuff. And yeah, he, he touches on it a little bit when he talks about the epistemology of television, and we could call it the epistemology of the internet. But again, I'm not like a doomsayer. I don't have pessimistic views or anything like that. I just don't think the answer is to fix technologies. I think the answer is for people to fix themselves, <clears throat> not for people to fix other people either. You know, it's just for people to fix themselves. Yeah, that's, um, you know, that kind of does bring up a question that I had DM'd to us from a, a guy on Twitter. I don't know how to, his his username is H-E-R-R-A-P-R-K-L. And he, he had DM'd us a couple questions that we'll get to, but one of them he had asked was if we were optimistic or pessimistic about the future. Um, I'll say uh, my, view, my worldview, my viewpoints are shaped by the fact that I'm a Christian. And so because of that, I do not subscribe to the Christian belief of the rapture. I subscribe to the Christian belief that um, the world will more so end peacefully. So I'm always optimistic in the long term. In the short term, I think things are gonna get pretty bad. Um, I think though that we'll come out of it and things could potentially be more prosperous than ever. So that's how I personally look at it. I'm always gonna um, look at everything in the long run as optimistic in the long run, maybe a hundred or a few hundred years out. Um, so uh, with that being said, with this book, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it just helped me, you know, put some things in context right after I read this with the Republican debates, which I want to get to in a second, but I wanted to ask you to, you know, are you pessimistic? Are you optimistic about the future? Um, maybe more so with, with this book, uh, um, in mind. One thought that came to mind, uh, when you were talking, David, is the fact that like entertainment itself isn't bad, but the problem is when entertainment masquerades as uh, informative and in important, you know, and where everyone's just trying to get 
a sound bite or a clip like, hey, talk about economic disaster. You have, you know, uh, 90 seconds to do so. <laughs> and then, you know, you can't have a debate about that. Um, one thing I found interesting is, you know, the Abraham Lincoln debate was that they talked for like three hours and like took a break and then had dinner. And then we'd go back and they would talk again. And um, now we're just like, so that was before for presidential debates. I mean, it was like an all day event where they were talking about serious issues for nine hours. And yeah. now, you know, with the the election in 2016, what the opening debate with Trump, he's just talking about Marco Rubio's penis size. Like that's the, de that's the debate now. It's like, who cares what people do with their genitalia? Let's talk about some issues. Yeah, that's exactly it. Thoreau said, Thoreau commented on that. Uh, he said, this was around the telegraph, I believe. He said, we're in great haste to construct the magnetic telegraph from Maine to Texas, but Maine to Texas might not have anything important to communicate. We're eager to tunnel under the Atlantic and bring the old world some new near news nearer to the new world. But the first news that'll leak through the broad flapping American ear is that Princess Adelaide has a whooping cough. And that's that's really kind of the idea when it comes to the technologies themselves. Marshall McLuhan said the the message is the medium. And when you talk about the debates, the debates then where they held concepts in their minds for for hours and couldn't formulate rebuttals, or they actually formulated many rebuttals around some of the points that they knew their opponent would be making, and then had the kind of mental agility to navigate and, and talk to whatever points it, it might be. It's not in a pessimistic way that I say we're losing that, but when we we anthropomorphize computers, you know, we actually call a computer's capacity to store memory you know what i mean but a computer doesn't have memory we just call it memory and we think it's an advancement because we don't have to know how to drive anywhere because we have a gps uh, we don't have to hold anything in our uh, minds our friend's cell phone number because we have a cell phone that holds it for us and that that's fine but it could create a kind of atrophy just like when you don't use your physical muscles, they atrophy. It's kind of a use it or lose it. And it can also yeah. create a bunch of well, confusion, but also if you consider something like a trial or a debate, it's held orally, right? After the trials or debate is performed, you only know of the outcome. We only know of these outcomes of these debates, what happened, who got elected. If, if there's a court case or a court trial, we only know and who versus who, and we know who won, and then the precedent is sent, set on using it as an example. The oral disappears, and although it is recorded with a stenographer, the written doesn't endure. We just cite the outcomes of these, and then, you know, that's all there is. And we don't recall the points or the, the idea that they were thinking, which is a little bit kind of back to what I just said with McLuhan when he talks about the medium being the message and the epistemology of things like this technology. But to answer the question, which I, of course, didn't even touch on, I'll try to make it. I'm not pessimistic or optimistic, really. Um, but if you consider where things are going, do you remember at the early days of the internet, it was this decentralized cyber talk, cyberpunk kind of anarchy point of view, like down with the system. This is going to give the power to the people. And now we see it as a completely captured yeah. establishment mouthpiece where everyone's complacent and with censorship and taking away the exact principles that it kind of started yes. with. We see bills being passed now. Enforced. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, you know. Oh, yeah. Enforced yeah, echo chambers. You know, yeah. And it used to be, again, this internet thing was built on this free platform of cyberpunk, anarchist almost kind of view. Just to take another big or powerful tool was crypto. This was a buck the system fiat currency that was invincible through everything. Although Ethereum was robbed, they just reset their calendar and took back the hundreds of millions that someone stole from them. But that's completely besides the point. 
the media has done a smear campaign for about 12 or 13 years about how crypto was going to inspire dark web criminals, which is always how they frame it. It's always health and safety and pulling on the heartstrings of people. And it usually involves using children. But crypto was this big evil thing for about 12 or 13 years. And it was going to be the downfall of society because of crime and criminals and now you see the government rolling out a central bank digital currency, which is essentially crypto controlled and given and taken away by the government, as if our non-existent monopoly money called credit cards weren't already a central bank digital currency. So the the question you, I think that you, you sent over to me was, is it a free discourse or unusable junk? And I, I didn't really see it as either. I don't see the internet as free. It hasn't been free in a long time. As we were talking on the phone, I think a week or so ago, Wired ran an article in 07 about how many FBI and CIA computers were editing Wikipedia. And then in 2008, which was the article we were talking about, was about how the owner of Wikipedia said that Wikipedia hasn't been by uh, non-bias you know, since 2008. And... I guess it's a golden rule. You just got to remember that as magically good as something is, it can be just as terrible. There's a good quote by Carl Jung that says, no tree can stretch to heaven without roots in hell. And that's kind of why I think wow. the internet as an example, using crypto as an example, using these technologies as an example, they're really powerful. That's why they're so polarizing. But I don't think it's fair to call it unusable junk because I believe it's very, very usable junk. And what to me, usable junk is propaganda. And the Internet is like a lens which Western civilization sees the world. And it's not a petty affair to just write it off as junk. Like when you talk about Twitter and throwing poop, um, proverbs and sayings and phrases and jargons and slogans and memes, this is all very usable junk. And I think we take it too likely, but if it were junk, it wouldn't be so precious and fought over tooth and nail over business, you know, between businesses and markets and governments. If you view your attention as junk, you should change your life right now because it's pretty much all you have. And if you, if you consider editing, censoring, silencing, deplatforming, whatever those things are, the idea that if you repeat something enough, it becomes true. Well, what we as a culture seem to focus on a lot in public discourse is the junk. But I, I think overall that's a negative thing because it gets us into wars and conflicts and lets guilty walk and gets division polarizing, has us at each other's throats. But the powerful phrases that fuel the ideologies that often trump the rule of law. And we, we saw that during COVID it was police were given powers to arrest people, find people and prison people who didn't break a law. They just went against what they were calling guidelines. And in the UK, my girlfriend is, lives there, they were calling them decrees. They, they never passed any laws. They just had guidelines and suggestions and let the public do the shaming, but it would result in arrests and fines and imprisonments. And I like that example because in the book, he mentions that we use proverbs to settle disputes with children but we would never use them in a serious context. Well, I wanted to bring that up because we do use them in a serious context, not even 10 years after he wrote this book. And he uses the example in the book. He says, could you imagine a bailiff asking a jury if they have a verdict and the jury saying to err is to human, but forgive is to divine? You couldn't imagine a world where, the, where that works. Like you could, you know, you can imagine you playing with your kids and say, um, do as I say, not as I do, and all these other things. But you can't imagine this stuff really translating public discourse. But not 10 years after he wrote this, we have that very same thing happening actually in the courtroom where he gives the example. For example, OJ killed his wife. We know this. But because Cochran yes. said, if the glove does not fit, you must acquit, he gets off. So he just he rhymed. Yes, that's number one. You should be very suspicious when someone hits you with a rap or a rhyme because, <laughs> you know, phrases that kind of sound like they're rehearsed or maybe they don't necessarily belong in their vocabulary and you can tell they've heard it before and they've likely, they're likely mindlessly repeating it. But this reminds me of also something else of a slogan that I've been hearing now 
that overrides anything logical. And there's a woman, a CEO at uh, Twitter named Iacarino. And now in multiple interviews, she has said something repeating this phrase that she's clearly been media trained to repeat, to make stick. And the saying is lawful, but awful. And the, these are things that she deems necessary to censor because although there is nothing wrong with them legally, she finds them awful. So this is a basically yeah. giving otherwise perfectly legal speech to be either censored or throttled or right. arbitrarily changing subjective measures by whatever omniscient Twitter God considers awful because they say so today, which will which will also change next week. And meanwhile, while all this is going on, laws are passed every week that violate the Constitution and do not become important until they're brought to the Supreme Court. So the usable junk's very usable. It's called propaganda, and it works, and you shouldn't take it lightly. That's why you should kind of think that this stuff is not important, like let it eat you up or anything, but it's worth thinking about to some degree if you have time. What was interesting with, with reading this book, you know, was right after I read it, we had the, those Republican debates, and I was talking to somebody afterwards, and they're like, oh, I like Vivek Ramaswamy. And I said, what do you think about DeSantis? And he's like, oh, I don't know. And and they're talking about it. Now, and hear what I say. You don't have to like these guys, but hear what I'm saying. And this is what I told that person. I'm like, Vivek Ramaswamy, I think, is completely full of shit. You can go back and look at, at how he's contradicted himself, how he said... He's made fun of the Trumpers, and then he comes out. He's the he's the best president we've had. Well, then why are you running, numbnuts? Because he's running too, right? So the other thing is, um, the the person's opinion on Ron DeSantis was very much based off of his charisma or lack of charisma. And I said, this is the problem that we're having right now, is because you are basing your opinion off of Ron DeSantis's charisma. You can completely base your opinion off of Ron De, off of Ron DeSantis's policies because we can go back and look at what he's done like the, you can actually measure that right you don't need it doesn't matter what how charismatic he is you can look at what he's done in florida do you like it do you not that's you can base your decision off of that whether he has an awkward smile on a debate doesn't matter and we saw uh, you actually got to see when chris christie was in his prime people who don't know anything about chris christie have not been around in politics for very long uh, Chris Christie is always known as like beating the shit out of people, you know, uh, verbally. And That's when cool. he, he smacked up Vivek well, and he was right. He said, this guy sounds like he's chat GPT. And he was, he, this guy went back and you could tell that he had just, he studied people who were successful in politics, people like Barack Obama, uh, Trump, and he was trying to mix it all together to, to make himself look good. I think that the guy is completely full of shit. So again, all of a sudden he rises and now we keep hearing people talk about Vivek why? Because Vivek put on a show. That's what that was. He had put on a show. The other candidates on that stage, you can go back and look. Also, one more thing with Vivek. Vivek took big pharma money, uh, and he's like, oh, I, I took $90,000 from... Actually, I, think, I don't even know if it was big pharma. I, I think it was big pharma and George Soros. But he was saying, you know, I was younger. I didn't have any money. Well, you can look on his tax returns that year. He had netted $2 million that year. So he was not some broke college kid, right? So all the what I'm saying is you can go and look at the substance of these people and you can figure out pretty quickly, you know, who's, who's just putting on a show that dude was putting on a show and it just, it, it was just insane to have read this book, see the debates and then watch the public react to it and be like, damn, Neil Postman was spot on on all this. Yeah. He's all, I mean, going back to just about editing, uh, speech and censoring and all that. I mean, I'm going to start buying CDs again. I'm going back. I mean, like all the people that I like listening to, I'm going to buy them just because I noticed I was going through some of Eminem's old tracks over the last week on iTunes and you're not even allowed to look at his lyrics. They don't, they don't pop up like they do for every other song. It's just, it's locked. It's blacked out. You're <laughs> you not can't allowed. read the lyrics to Kim. <laughs> you can't read the lyrics to any of his songs, you know, and in that Marshall Mathers LP, you probably said fag like a hundred times. Yeah. I think all cut out. I mean, they even did that pre, I mean, like pre when censorship really started uh, ramping up with Michael Jackson, his song, they don't really care about us, you know, where he's like, you know, 
kick me, Jew me. They cut out, I mean, they blocked out Jew. So I didn't even know. They, that. Yeah, they're like, you're not allowed to say that. And that was, I mean, that was a while ago when they did that. And um, so if you want to hear, you know, where he actually is allowed to say the word Jew, you got to find his CD when that song was released in the 90s. Well, I'll tell you what, if you want to buy some CDs, you can go to king810.com. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> that that whole thing was just a process for that hits. for that pitch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we Postman doing. talks about that in the book. Actually, he says, uh, as you read this novel, you would not for a second take me. This is one of my favorite humorous parts. You might appreciate as a comedian. He said you wouldn't you wouldn't take me seriously for one minute if I dropped my paragraph to uh, write a sponsorship for Coca Cola or Southwest Airlines. You would throw this book away immediately. Yet we do it with the most important information of our day via the news. Uh, breaks to commercial every ninety seconds. Yes, and that's a, that. That was pretty funny. And to your point, what I what I kind of got out of that was with when you were talking about Vivek and the debates, and when you were talking about the the editing of the of the pat of the censorship of music and things like that. It reminded me of. Yeah. In the book, he talks about Galileo saying the language of nature is written in mathematics, but the, not the truth. And he says it used to be that seeing was believing, and then it was saying is believing, then it was reading is believing, then it was counting is believing, then it was deducing is believing. Well, now I feel like it is feeling is believing. Over the ages, the truth more oh, big time with the context. Yeah. Big time. Yeah, just go with your feeling. Just go with your heart. Oh, man. Yeah, that, that's what the whole culture is. You mean my by. giant <laughs> muscle filled with blood? <laughs> okay. By the way, notice how we have a whole culture and world based off of going by how they feel and everybody's completely miserable. I know, I never get that. The, the, yeah. All these people are on antidepressants and are miserable. Yeah, I, you know, Woody Allen said that when he start, you know, married his um, stepdaughter or adopted daughter and people were outraged by it. He goes, I was just following my heart. And they're like, Oh, all right, we get that. You know, the Bible says, we forgive you. I think it's in a proverb where the he Bible says, don't trust your heart. Daughter. Yeah. Yeah. It must've been his heart telling him to do that too. Yeah. Well, <laughs> if you want, but also you, you shouldn't listen to Woody Allen because he molested uh, Mia Farrow's daughter. If you've ever heard her sit on the phone with him crying, there's an audio of it where she sits on the phone crying to him. Like, how how could you do this? This She walks around, you know, she's walking around bleeding and crying and like uh, for days she's been, and she's just crying on the phone to Woody, who's just following his heart. Following his heart. Yeah, his so heart. that's a demon. Yeah, for sure. That's very demonic. So um, uh, I wanted to, like I said, it just reminded me of the the Bible verse um, about how you, you can't even trust your own heart. Um, and there are some religious aspects to, to this book. But before we get to that, let's talk about Zoloft. Brought to you, but no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, so in the book, he talks about a lot of religious stuff, and I wasn't sure really how to take it. Obviously, some of the people that he, he called out were fraudulent. He... He talks about Billy Graham a little bit, and I have a soft spot for Billy Graham because I I do think Billy was was legit. I I really do. Um, it's weird. He's got good points, and I and I don't know the answer to it. And I and I also I'm sure you'll have uh, thoughts on this, and I want to hear what both of you think. But he talks about how when you start putting church on TV, you have made it completely unholy because now you can just sit in your living room and you don't have to actually go to the place. Uh, to worship. And that is completely, I mean, that's completely true, right? At the same time, reading the book, I felt like he basically was saying, you know, like there shouldn't be any Christian stuff on TV. And that I, I have a tough time with because I think that Christians need to uh, adapt and, and use whatever technology there are for outreach and to talk to people and to express what their views are. It's just hard to to do that and not cheapen the message along the way. And so um, I thought that it was a, a fair critique, um, but I didn't think it was fair to maybe say Christians shouldn't be in these places. And so I guess I would be curious as to 
to what you guys think about that. How can you put out a Christian message on a TV or can you without cheapening it, making it unholy? I mean, yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't think that it is at all. I mean, it's just like anything else. I mean, it's just a way to, um, hear another perspective or to get information. I guess it just depends on what's being broadcast, but just like a sermon or a speech or something like that. I mean, we gotta, we, we have to consume, you know, the things that we want to hear some, somehow. Like, I don't know, like in there too, it talked about how he was comparing video to what the 10 commandments about like the image or whatever about, and I'm like, I don't, I didn't see that. Hmm. I, I mean, I don't think that those two correlate. I think that, um, you know, the image spoken about in, in the 10 commandments is a lot different than what he was describing it as video. David, what do you think? I more resonated with the idea that he was, if you, if you remember, he says that the churching, the sermoning, what have you, it did happen on TV actually. But just as we see with the technology of the internet, and this is what he means by the epistemology of television or the epistemology of the internet. There's a reason why everything has tapered into every thumbnail that we see on YouTube looks the same because it's aggregated and it is rewarded algorithmically. And this is what he was saying about religious messages. He, he talks about religious messages presenting themselves on television and how, if you recall in the early days, what he says was, this pastor brought a guitar and rocked a little bit, if you remember that analogy he uses and says, you know, rock music's not blasphemous. I can rock with my sermon to make it more appealing. Um, what he's saying is the he makes a difference between the tool, which is the technology, which is a tool and, and a medium. And I'm going to keep saying it, but when yeah. Marshall Cluen says the medium is the message, what he's saying is you cannot retain that, um, whether it be religious, whatever the message is, the information in this medium the medium the is the message he's saying that it's not a tool or a technology it's not a pistol laying on the on the thing it is that but in another sense what he's talking about when he says the medium is the medium is the environment that that tool creates and i think just to give you a an example um, I have to, I don't, can't believe I'm going to quote Marx, but Marx had a great, uh, observation about this. He said, um, Homer's Iliad is not possible with the printing press. And we think, well, of course, this is the only way, only way we read it. We go to Amazon and order Homer's Iliad. It's the only way you and I know it. But what he says is there is no singing and no dancing, no telling of tales, no talking and and acting out the muses all of this ceases and so does the condition for epic poetry disappear and that's what he means and that's what he's talking about postman is talking about with the religious television the, the television is being curated and hijacking essentially the information and i don't believe you're getting a sermon it's it's las vegas entertainment and public discourse and he, he says Plato 2,300 years ago saying conversations were able to decide what ideas were expressed and create culture, which is fine. But Postman uses an analogy I don't agree with, but I do agree with in some sense. He says that Native American smoke signals were communications. And those smoke signals didn't include philosophical arguments because puffs of smoke can't philosophize, right, about the nature of existence. Yeah. And although I agree... I'll I'll disagree and then I'll come back to agree. The notions that were being able to be expressed in clouds of smoke, which is why the analogy is a bad one, were not philosophies about the nature of existence. It's it's it goes back to the quote. Of, Wasn't smoke signals just like help me? <laughs> yeah, it goes back to Thoreau saying that you know the only telegraph between the old and new world will just convey that the princess has a whooping cough. So we know that native yeah. philosophies communicate these things through oral, through tradition, through the sacred stories and rituals, just like today, sometimes through substances, sometimes through all of these 
types of passing down and generational dictating culture. So it's a bad analogy in that sense. But what the point that he makes that I think is relevant to this question is when he talks about the news of the day. And that's why I bring up the smoke signals and repurpose it as an inferior form of communication, like the one you're saying about the religion on television. So we as humans can fancy ourselves so advanced as to keep track and, you know, and have opinions about everything in the world. But there's there's no such thing as news of the day. There's only fragments of information in the form of media events that we're told we should care about. This is why we send $100 billion to Ukraine, but ignore a genocide in Yemen that we actually uh, arm. Or the truth is most Americans can't tell you where either of these places are, and they'll never go to either of them. But they can rattle off a bunch of facts about the Donbass. So this is what he means about the medium <laughs> message. Uh, and he says that, you know, the religious loses that in the medium. And the medium, the technology and the tool create an environment that loses the overall but it would be like saying you know that church and religious services that you were talking about it would be like saying i read a novel a day because i read um 500 tweets and 200 text messages which is the equivalent words of a novel but we know that's not true it's not so consider that consider yeah, that, that... text messages and in, in my tw in, in tweet reading now consider the sermon you see on television and you've given sermons in person. So what do you, you know, what do you think about that? No, you're completely right. Like I said, um, you know, I think he talks about, I think he talks about Benny Hinn maybe in this book, but even Benny Hinn's uh, nephew, Costi Hinn has come out against that. You, anybody interested? Yeah, that's a good book. Costi Hinn. But, um, but yeah, like I said, so those guys are obviously fraudulent. Um, I, I thought Billy was legit. And and as somebody who, like you just mentioned, David, like putting together a sermon, um, I thought being a pastor is probably a relatively easy job. I mean, what, you only have to work like one day a week, right? Um, but if you want to put a sermon together the right way, there's a difference between topical preaching and expository. Uh, a lot of people have different views and they clash. Um, people will defend topical preaching and you can't have good topical sermons, but topical is essentially where it's like, I'm going to preach on forgiveness today. So now I got to find all the verses about forgiveness and pull them all together and, um, and, and make a sermon out of it. Maybe that's not a good explanation of it, but that's what a lot of people do. And they can, they can cheapen the message that way. Expository is more about taking this con taking the verse or paragraph that you're going to preach, looking at the book as a whole, looking at the chapters before it, the chapters after or the, the paragraphs or, or words before it, after it, trying to put it in its proper context. You tell the people this is the historical context. This is what they're trying to convey. This is, uh, you know, what it means. And this is how you can relate it to your life today. Um, that's a lot of work. That's hard to do that. That would be very hard to do that on a, on a TV show where there are commercial breaks. At the same time, I wouldn't want Christians to completely leave uh, TV or, or entertainment. You know what I mean? I was thinking... Uh, I always think that if you took a movie such as Gladiator, but if you made it about King David, how awesome of a movie, you know? Oh, that dude, <laughs> I always say that the Bible is way more hardcore than like Game of Thrones, like the Old Testament. I mean, there's yeah. some stories yeah. in there where it's like, dude, I mean, like if you turn that into a series like Game of Thrones, yeah, people would be like, holy shit. Um, you know, just one instance, and I don't even know what book it is, but it's when... You know, some people from a city, like the king of that city or whatever, his son rapes one of his daughters. And so they're like, yeah, my son raped your daughter, so they should get married. And they're like, well, you got to circumcise yourself first, is what his son said. And so this entire city, all the males like circumcise themselves so they can be married to the, the that tribe's daughters. And then while they're healing, they just like three of them go into town and kill every single male with swords as they're holding their their skinned genitalia, and um, that would that would be a pretty cool show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have five minutes here to wrap it up, and I kind of I, think so. I wanted to just go around and say, you know, do you think it's a 1984 world or do you think it's a brave new world um, world? 
Road to World. And I, I personally, I think it's a little bit of both because we see 1984 yes. with the, you know, the censorship and all that. But then also, I mean, I'm leaving, leaning more heavily on the side of Brave New World just because of, you know, just everyone is, um, I think, inherently obsessed with distractions. And I remember reading once or hearing once that someone said, you know, we distract ourselves so much because subconsciously everybody is trying to distract themselves from their eventual death. Yeah. Like they don't want to think about death. They don't want to think about, you know, the real outcome of being part of this world. Um, so, I mean, I think that in the future it is, it's like, that's why they had coliseums. That's why they had gladiators fight each other. So I, I think it's all about inter entertainment in order for people to distract themselves from the real issues. That's my point. Yeah, I'll, and I'll answer that. And then, uh, David, I'll have you answer and then tell everybody what the next book is because it'll roll together. I think it's a it's a mix of all of them. And I also think it's heavily a mix of A Clockwork Orange as well, where you see the government letting gangs roam the streets uh, violently at night because they don't want people out and about um, you know, making political groups or anything like that. So they let these gangs and uh, violent teenagers or whatever go out and terrorize people. And I think we're seeing that today and I think it's going to uh, get worse. So I definitely think it's a collection of all of them. Uh, David, go ahead and answer us and close us out with our next book. You mind if I just rattle off a handful of thoughts that I, when I'm reading the book, I always just write on the pages uh, just the thoughts that come to mind sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. completely unre un unrelated, but it basically summarizes the the whole thing and kind of with the question. So these are just the thoughts that were rattling off. There's something to think about regarding the issue of was it Orwell or 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 Huxley? I think Orwell described a prison. Huxley described a burlesque. We've evolved now into a burlesque prison. Politics is show business and the biggest spectator wow. sport in the world. The medium is electronic. The sponsor are large corporations. There's nothing virtuous or having of integrity. Advertisers are dramas and myth is in visual space, regardless of the true or false statements. Be suspicious of celebrity sponsors. The business of business has become pseudotherapy. The consumer is a patient assured by psychodrama. We do not get information in 15 second clips. We get hits of a drug. You're not being informed. You're using advertisements work on us because we're self-obsessed the ministry of truth wasn't an orwellian fiction we have one and after a public backlash it changed its name and is alive a well and underground today and that's been reported on extensively our country was founded by intellectual sages and scientists it should be no surprise intellectualism has replaced the divine and the sacred it's okay to stop thinking sometimes and to laugh but it's not okay to not know what we're laughing about or why we stopped thinking be careful of the sea of amusements surrounding us. They could harden into prison walls. If all information was equal, we would all read the equivalent of a novel in a day in the form of text and tweets, becoming experts in literacy. It's clear that's not the case. Americans are Marxists who believe technology is leading us to a great utopia. The pitch for television is that it would shed light on all forms of racism, but now we see that it may do that and also take a good part in helping to create perhaps more than it exposes. We are highly entertained, but very uninformed. Affairs of the state devolved into arguments about social and moral issues, two things politics should stay out of. Separating church and state was a ploy for those who wanted to be popes but had no desire for the religious, experts that wanted to control the procession. Technology is a tool, a medium is the environment that the tool creates. An example of this would be the hashtag Me Too movement, but also the OnlyFans movement that followed. We all build castles in the sky. The problem arises when we try to live wow. in them. Wow. Well, there we go. Yeah, uh, that's awesome. What's our David, you want to go ahead and tell us what our next book is? So we can read Brave New World next. I'm there glad you said ahead. that because Thank I you. just, that's what I've, I just started reading. Because I'm like, all right, this got me. Because I've, I've read 1984 mm -hmm. more than I've read the, this book. So... This is what we're doing, Brave New World. Same, I like do that one just yeah. because people kind of compare them, but 1984, Orwell wrote about what actually was happening. People are like, I think I've talked to you, Matt, about this, where um, they're like, he was so yes. prescient, he predicted this shit. And it's like, no, it was happening at the time. It was happening then, and he wrote about it. <laughs> yeah. 
1984 is true. Huxley. Yeah. And it's was, always been happening. You know, Huxley they burned the was, first guy that translated yeah. the Bible into, you know, the native language. They're like, burn him. Mm -hmm. These yeah. made the book, you know, like that's a, that's an extreme and case of censorship. That was our first episode of the Boogeyman Book Club. Uh, again, we went over Amusing Ourselves to Death by Neil Postman. Now we're going to do Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. And the last thing I want to say, too, I didn't get a whole lot of questions on this, and maybe it was because I joked about how there are stupid questions. Um, if you send, me, send us a question, I'll take it seriously. Um, you know, Maybe we'll get to it on the show. Maybe we won't. Um, I think we're all tickled pink for every person that listens to this. So um, we would absolutely love it if you you know, took the time to read these books. If you do have questions, please don't be afraid to ask. Another thing I asked too, um, if you get the book because of the show, please take a picture with it or take a picture of you with the book. Um, I'd like to make a thumbnail out of that. I think that that would be uh, really cool. So thank you for everybody. Seriously, I mean it. If you went out and, and picked up a book because we, talk, we talked about it and you read it, that is amazing. Um, there is some hesitancy with Brave New World, but I, I assured David that we can push through it if it gets a little dry or whatever at times. You guys can handle it. Let's do it. Let's uh, let's get reading a thing again. <laughs> Read it till your brain hurts. You yeah. just got to push. Yeah. Push through, baby. Um, I look forward to the next one with you, David. As always, thanks, man. <laughs>